Today on the show, we have Bryce Morgan. Bryce is a longtime friend of mine and a research analyst with Sierra Nevada Brewery in Chico, California. If you like this show, please consider following and subscribing on whichever platform you are listening on and share it around if you think it's interesting and insightful. Thank you and on with the show. Welcome to the Sayorsa podcast. Today, my guest is Bryce Morgan. Bryce, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Yeah, I'm Bryce. I am a Chico State alumni and I'm currently working at Sierra Nevada as a research analyst and I'm excited to be on the podcast. Right on. Well, thanks for coming. The first question is, tell your story. How did you grow into the person you are today? Oh, man. Um, starting off deep. Yeah. Well, I guess kind of going back to the beginning, uh, born and raised in Florida for the first half of my life. Um, and kind of from there, just moved around quite a bit, moved from Florida to North Carolina, popped over Northern California in the Bay down to SoCal and back up to Chico for school, just been hanging out here. So, um, kind of started off early with just a lot of moving and gaining perspective from different places. And I think that's kind of really been a detrimental part in like, me being who I am today. It's kind of all that moving and learning all these new perspectives from different towns. Sure. So having that opportunity to collect the different perspective never really, I don't know, maybe never set down like strong roots in an area. How has that impacted like how you go about relationships now? Do you not really feel tied even to Chico, even though you've been here almost five years? Yeah, I think that's a good point in terms of like putting down roots because I don't think I've actually... Like, if you ask me where my true home is, um, I wouldn't actually name a place. I would probably just brush it off as wherever my family is. But looking at it on a deeper level, um, I guess, yeah, I don't really move to a place thinking that this will even be my new home because I don't really think of it in terms of a home. Like, I, I live in a house and I've lived in many, um, but none of them I really call, like, the true sense of home. It's really, I guess, the people I'm with. But I have moved so many times that I always kind of, when I move to a place, almost think of the next that I'll go. Yeah. I'd say the longest I've been in one place has probably been three years. I mean, I went to the same high school for all four years. But other than that, um, been to two different middle schools. And I'd say every two-ish years in elementary school, I'd, I'd transfer. Um Sometimes just around Orlando and other times like all the way up to, to Raleigh, North Carolina. So in terms of schooling, housing, it's always been kind of changing. So I never really even moved to a place thinking that that'll be where I set roots. It's just another stage of my life. And I never really think of it as being like the long term. Okay. So how did you find your way up to Chico? And when you went to school, what major did you choose and why did you choose it? Yeah, so I came up to Chico from Southern California. I was kind of living in the Orange County area. Um, and I guess while I was living there, I I met a lot of cool people there, but I never truly feel like my interests really clicked with living there as much as it did when I was living more rurally, like in North Carolina. Um, and I guess why I'm bringing that up is it the first thought in my head when I, everyone was naming their colleges, they're all naming like, local places like all the ucs and all that kind yeah. of stuff um my first thought was well, i don't want to be in california yeah you know like i'm not california born and raised i i really enjoyed the other places i've lived outside of it and if i had to even name a home i probably wouldn't have named california so my first thought went well i moved around so much and i think i gained this perspective of every time i keep moving i find more areas that i almost enjoy more than the last for the most part so I don't necessarily even want to go back to where I came from. Like I wasn't even looking at going back to North Carolina or going back to Florida, but instantly I, you know, I'd gone on some road trips up north. I was like, oh, Oregon's cool, Washington's cool. Maybe I should try something new, go to Colorado. So all the schools I was looking at was, um, I looked at like Colorado State, I looked at um, Oregon a little bit, but my heart really kind of fell on Washington State even. So you might be like, how'd I end up at Chico? And yeah. That's a little bit more of a longer story, but I essentially like went up and visited knowing that I wanted to do uh, nutrition and dietetics. That's kind of what I had my heart set on originally. Um, the program up there really was kind of a letdown when I actually talked to all the people there. It 
It was very up, small. Up in Washington? Up in Washington, yeah. yeah. Only eight people, I think, actually got selected for two years in to go. So you would go there studying nutrition. Yeah. And then two years in, you'd apply into, like, the dietetics part of it. And, and they only... Five, like, one sentence summary, what is dietetics? So dietetics is just kind of like the clinical study of nutrition. So okay. if you go to, like, a hospital... And um, you'll be assigned a dietitian who's basically going to oversee your food okay. while you're on there. Yeah, that makes sense. Whether you're prepping for surgery or you're in long-term care or something like that. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what I was passionate about. I was getting really into healthy eating myself and realizing that I could actually change my diet and, and affect um, my own life and how I felt. So that was kind of how I chose dietetics. But while I was up there in Washington looking at their program... Um, yeah, basically two years in, they would only let eight people into the next stage of the program. And if not, you had to hang around for an extra year doing who knows what just to apply in again. And it also wasn't a bachelor's program. It was master's only. Oh, okay. And I wasn't really, I mean, even though I could see myself going for a master's at the time, especially, I didn't want to limit myself to really having to compete to get into this really hard program with so few spots only to realize I have to be here for six years anyways. Yeah. So that was pretty last minute. I was working with my high school guidance counselor and her husband actually went to Chico okay. and talked about how they had a dietetics program and talked about how much her husband had loved coming to Chico and everyone was already locking in their decisions. They're like, I'm going here, I'm going there and I needed to find mine. Yeah. So very last minute, like I remember calling my guidance counselor before getting back on the plane up in Washington being like, you know, her and I had talked about like, Oh, this is going to be it. Like I'm going to Washington state until that, that phone call where I was, you know, I had to rethink my whole plan. I was like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> and basically the next weekend we were already planning on me going up to Chico cause I needed to make a decision. She highly recommended this. I had no more guidance cause I hadn't thought about anything else yeah. at all. You were kind of like tunnel visioned onto Washington and then you realized like right. the light at the end of the tunnel wasn't what you thought. Yeah. And the next weekend, sure enough, I was up at Chico. Um, I flew up with, with my parents and we did a, a guided tour. It was in the winter here. It was, you know, mid-January, raining. Cold. Cold. But honestly, that made me love it. Like I was coming from... SoCal, where it never rains, it's always green. It's never cold. <laughs> if it's never cold, if you see a tree change color, it's probably because it's the color red because it's on fire. Yeah. Like, that's the only <laughs> color change you're going to see. Yeah. Um, so coming up here where there's a river running through campus and beautiful trees and all that stuff, I, I was kinda, blown away. And it kind of like, would you say it made you feel like you did like North Carolina and Florida more like rural. exactly it, it made me realize hey there's seasons here and <laughs> it's probably not the best idea to choose a school for like the campus and, and the climate it's probably you know better to choose it for like maybe it's academic rigor but sure. a huge selling point for me was that like it's an escape Sure. It's it's far enough away from my parents not as far as Washington would have been but it's it's enough to to kind of distance myself from where I currently was. It was a change of pace and it came back to kind of the key aspects of what I loved about the East Coast and that sure. was the seasons and all that. So okay. I, you know, even sent in applications to like UC Davis or a couple other schools, you know, you have like your safety nets or some reach schools. But before I even heard back from any of them, I had already fallen in love with Chico. I talked with people in the program for nutrition and they were so open to all my questions and really laid everything out. And, you know, four years bachelor's program, the rate for people getting into a dietetic internship after, which is kind of a big deal. Like everyone yeah. does it's their like undergrad. Right. So, you know, people in med school might do their whole college experience and then they apply into med school and do that with dietetics. It's very much you get your undergrad in an accredited dietetics program and then everyone applies in to an internship. And if sure. they don't get into the internship, they can't become a dietitian. And the rate at Chico for getting an internship was about 75%. And the national average is uh, 50, like one, like one in two people get it. So Chico being pretty much an exceptionally good school for dietetics with that percentage, like yeah. was also a big draw. So what, what was the, 
biggest surprise once you got to Chico? I know you said you didn't initially pick it for the academic rigor, but do you think your perspective of Chico changed over the years? Um, it, oh, it's definitely changed. I, I wanted Chico to be a very, you know, kind of academic school, but obviously, you know, people hear the rumors, like it's a party school, like that kind of gets tossed around. And I'd heard that a lot coming into it. And I kind of came into college not having any interest in partying ever. Like I had, you know, I didn't really have any experience with like drinking and all this stuff. And I, I was more of this like introverted, like bookworm type personality. Um, you know, like in high school, my friends and I would go out on a Friday night and like we'd go to like a boba place and drink tea. Like we weren't trying to like drink alcohol behind uh-huh. the Seven yeah, Eleven. Yeah. you know. So it, <laughs> it wasn't really like what I think a lot of other people really wanted their freshman experience to be like they probably came here you know wanting the chico vibe and i kind of came here almost resenting it and not being too open to it um but over the four years i kind of got this like established friend base and i guess the biggest surprise to answer your question me coming to chico is like realizing how much i actually like the vibe of the town it was something i was initially resenting but it kind of just grew on me Mm -hmm. i would tell myself every year like I'm going to leave Chico as soon as I can. Like, I'm, I'm here for school, I'm here for the dietetics thing, and then I'm out. You know, I'm, I'm going to search for something that, it's probably bad to say, but in my head I thought, like, would be better. Sure. And now I look at that sentence, like, I feel like I've found a lot that people search for in Chico, and I have the environment to thank for that. So yeah. I think it's really just changed my own perspective on it yeah i would say my my perspective of chico was very similar like coming in i was like oh it's a party school you know if i go i'm gonna have to like drink and do drugs and like i think i've definitely come to realize that there's a lot more that that this university has to offer and this town has to offer so I, i definitely agree with that yeah exactly so studying dietetics and you you just talked a lot about you went to college you picked the one for the dietetics program, and now you work in a brewery. How that <laughs> right, <happen? laughs> which might seem kind of opposite of what someone who's very yeah, beer is in, healthy in a pro I've health field would no. do. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's a question that even I kind of have to think back to what my thought process was because I was trying to be the nutritional picture of health in high school. Like I really almost obsessively planned out my weekly meals to be as balanced and healthy as possible. And that's definitely slacked a bit. Um, And I guess it grew from two things. It grew from all these summer internships and jobs that I would get throughout college where I realized that what I was leaning towards when I was looking for jobs was very initially like agriculture based and almost um i guess you know like more food science based like i i realized everyone wanting to be a dietitian was talking about how they're trying to be a dietary aid and and that job is is basically you know maybe you're in like a like a elderly home and your job is to basically deliver the food from the kitchen to the to to the patients and that very patient serving yeah it's very patient serving that's a you know, if you're ever trying to be a dietitian, or you're looking for like experience to get that is what any professor or dietitian would recommend. That's probably where they all started. And I just really didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to be outside. I'd come to Chico for the outdoors for the seasons. And, you know, even though I had set my mind on becoming a dietitian, when I was actually looking at all these job websites, all I wanted to do was work outside. I wanted to have some connection to nature and what I did because I thought I would find fulfillment in it. Mm -hmm. And that started off with um, a summer job working on a, on a farm, but doing like a, it was like a nutrition summer camp for kids. So that might sound a little strange, but you know, everyone knows the premise of a summer camp. Like you go, you play games, you have activities and stuff, but this was on this, I guess, kind of urban farm in Southeastern Portland where, Um, We would take the kids down to the garden. We'd pick fresh vegetables. We'd kind of like cook with them in very simple ways. You know, we don't want them to use a bunch of sharp knives and stuff like that. But but we would kind of show them where their food came from in like a fun way. Like we would play a lot of games and do a lot of art and stuff like that that a normal summer camp would. But 
I chose that job because it was the only nutrition related thing I could find that involved the outdoors. Okay. Um, and the aspects I really liked, you know, I like teaching people about healthy eating. I, I like all that, but I just loved like strapping on boots and going outside and like part time being a farmer, part time yeah. leading kids around, you know, like it, it was enjoyable. And by the time the next summer came around, I was like, okay, I've checked off a nutrition box as an internship. Mm -hmm. Now I want to go a little more scientific based. And I looked more for like a lab thing. I looked okay. for like, again, a food science thing, not a, not a dietetics related job. Really. Yeah. I, I was telling myself in my head, I can relate this back to nutrition. I can say like, well, it's food. I'm working with food. And that's obviously like the core basis of what any nutrition you're job really is. doing like the food science part yeah and then you know that i ended up getting a summer internship at the usda up in washington and i didn't even step foot in a lab for until the second month the first month i was working in a greenhouse yeah, second was, of three months or of uh i guess like two two and a half, and a half the months. first whole okay. month i was yeah working in a greenhouse i was um propagating plants i was doing leaf cuttings to like look at the dna of what was in there i was interesting they even sent me around to a couple random uh farms more for an educational purpose but they sent me to a, i worked on a goat farm for a week i went to a all-female run um cattle ranch where they walked through the entire process of like moving the cows around all the way up to slaughter like not to say I really have any interest in doing that, but it was kind of the same. It was a learning experience. And it saw, it definitely showed me where my food came from when we pulled up in a car onto this farm and these ladies have this cow strung up and they're like cutting off the, the meat for selling. Yeah. And, you know, everyone will eat a hamburger and they just see this like round patty. But in that moment, I saw exactly how it starts. And, yeah. um, Things like that, even though nothing I necessarily did there was what I really wanted to do, it just really like solidified this idea that maybe it's not the dietetics part I like if all the jobs I'm choosing have nothing to do with dietetics. Maybe it's just it's food and where food comes from and the science of, of how it's created. Um, so then about sophomore year of college, I got this notion like of making wine. I was like, what's the coolest job I can think of. And it was yeah. probably walking through a vineyard, assessing when to pick grapes and when to make like the perfect bottle of wine. I thought it, it artfully matched the food science experience that I was, I was uh, enjoying doing as, in terms of a job and all this nature that I do in my free time as my hobby. And being in Chico with Sierra Nevada being right down the street, um, you know, although it wasn't wine, it was still, it was still fermentation. It was still yeah. this big food science process. And luckily, right around the time I was turning 21, they opened up an internship at Research and Development. And that kind of like kickstarted even more this separation that I had from dietetics and further into, into, the, into food science. Right on. So you mentioned earlier, like artfully matching. I know one of the things knowing you for a few years now is like you're a very artistic person. How do you go about sort of pulling those hobbies of art into your work life and then just bringing them and, and being able to explore those hobbies in your free time. Right. Um, and, th and that's, yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly a big point in why I thought there's probably not much. I mean, there's a lot of problem solving and creativity that could have come from being a dietitian. There's a lot of, um, you know, you have to figure out kind of what the patient has and how to treat them. And, and that's probably what I would have le like leaned on for mm -hmm. kind of creative outlets if I took that route. But I knew I wasn't like much of a physical artist, but I just liked being creative. I'd taken a lot of photos and it kind of sparked like the interest in, in, in process creation and improvement. And that would initially come from me like taking photos and trying to find the perfect composition. And then eventually I, you know, with home brewing and with my work, like, I mean, the fundamental basis of research and development is like people come to you with problems and you have to figure out how to, 
how to solve it and creative critical thinking and it's creative critical thinking it's it really challenges the brain it challenges um just i don't know i mean it's it's always new um i've really leaned in on some of my like initial creative outlets like photography or drawing or painting or just whatever i've tried to do um into like that's what i find enjoyment in so whatever i end up doing with my life that's what i want to keep doing right on so sometimes i know be it you know lack of availability of free time or lack of money to do sort of these things so what do you find the biggest barriers to you exploring your passions um definitely definitely the time part i think uh it was a little bit of a shock leaving college and realizing how little time you have after the work day and that was not something i really thought i'd have a problem with like in college i i feel like i worked pretty hard I, there was a time right when i was starting at the brewery where i was balancing three jobs school and rowing like i could not think that my schedule and i had a social life like yeah. I, I couldn't think that my schedule could have been any busier than that um but there was something about having like a one or two hour gap in the middle of the day between classes where you can just kind of like you can rest and relax yeah that was honestly enough for me to kind of not burn out too frequently um but transitioning to work where it's every day all day especially now in winter like you get home it's dark like it's it does kind of cut into your ability to like do other passions outside of work and you know you and i always talk about ideas about what could be something that we can do on the side and what's fun and it's honestly time is probably the biggest barrier um you know like money is one thing but it's also it's one thing to like invest in something that you're really passionate about and that's something that i'm willing to do but you have to find the time and the space and right now it's it's a challenge it's not impossible but it's i'd say time definitely okay so in there you mentioned that having a couple hour break in the middle of the day during college helped you deal with burnout and with the economy looking the way it is with the great uh, resignation as they're as they're calling it with everyone falling out of their jobs how do you deal with burnout and exhaustion of your of the mundane i guess (laughs) um that's something I'm definitely still learning. I'm definitely a couple months into into full time work, and it can be a struggle. I guess something that has helped is finding like almost routine outside of work social things, like you know playing a sport or exercise or um you know just meeting up with a friend on a regular day or even just kind of trying to let loose on like a friday and go out to the bars just anything that can kind of separate um i guess all that responsibility and stress that you carry with you from the week so um i guess i don't know i thought that just came up to me was you're talking about like creative passions and what's the biggest barrier and now bringing up this like almost like work-life separation question is, you know, part of a big part of what I do in my day for a job sparked from my passion. Like I chose passion over, I guess the most like lucrative career I could have. Um, And I guess that also plays into it where if I was filling up all my free time with, with my passions, it would essentially be like doing a similar thing that I did at work. Yeah. Um, Like I was, homebrewing very regularly before I started working at the brewery but now that I do that at work all day it's not necessarily something that I come home and do so and and I don't think that's a bad thing because I'm actually exploring my passions for a profit at work um and that's almost fulfilling enough so I guess the passions that I I do try to explore outside of work are almost more of what I started developing interests in back in high school like now i want to start camping a lot more and taking photos and i've really kind of been able to do that because i guess the passion that had initially started taking over my life which was like brewing and all that i i already feel fulfilled in so it's it's honestly great that I think I have so many interests and so many hobbies that kind of checking off one or two at work is good because I it gives me time to 
start to feel fulfilled in like in like other things. Awesome. So, um, like you mentioned earlier, you moved around a lot when you were growing up. How do you think that's influenced your perspective of the world? Do you think you're more understanding of different people? Do you? Um, yeah, I I certainly hope that I'm more understanding of of other people and where they come from. There's there's been a lot of moments with a lot of those moves where. <sighs> I guess you get uprooted from where you are. You get taken to a new place, put in a new school system. You have no friends. You know, I could luckily lean on my sister a lot for for kind of like friendship because in those transitions, like she was was the only one who was going through the exact same experience I was. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, But in those moves, you know, there's... Everyone talks about their like being a little nervous for their first day of school, but how many people go nearly every year at a new school nervous that it's the first day, but also nervous that you can't just see the friends that you hung out with all summer because you haven't met them yet. Yeah. Um, we would typically move at like the beginning of summer. So the whole summer would be like, well, I don't really know anyone. So I'd kind of play with like my sister and hang out with my family and stuff like that. And then first day everyone already knows each other and you're trying to meet meet new friends so i would like to think that it did push me a little socially to like try to meet new friends for moving that many times i probably should be better at just like picking up friends left and right because i've had to like fresh start all the time but I, i guess it you know, it honestly made me okay with telling the same story over and over again, because I kind of like, this is going to sound weird, but you kind of know like what people respond well to in terms of like what you say about yourself and what people like don't really care about because no one like needs to be your friend. You have to like earn it. So it kind of made me realize like, Oh, I've, and a lot of those stories that people would respond well to were, from places I've come from, like you know, I tell a bunch of Florida stories, and yeah. like people really like them, especially yeah, in California. Florida's, I mean, yeah, yeah. So it it and it, I guess in essence, like what that kind of taught me is yeah, like Florida boy. <laughs> yeah, and people, you know, they love hearing stories about gators and all that kind of stuff, yeah. and like you, you can't tell that story to another person in Florida and then be interested in it. You can't go to Alabama and tell them a gator story and think that they'll find it interesting because it's part of their environment too. Yeah. Um, so people really, I guess, get a kick out of like different lifestyles and moving around so much, you get insight into all these lifestyles. Like if I went in reverse order of moving and I started in say Orange County in Southern California, where it's a little more upscale, a little more bougie and then moved to Florida, like people would probably get a kick out of all the rich kid stories that you, yeah, yeah, the big I mean, what they see is like big city. What they maybe. see is big city, yeah. yeah. No one in Irvine is going to call it a big city, yeah. but it's... Well, and you you know, nobody... I mean, I don't want to say nobody, but there's there's obviously relatively few people who know Irvine, so you'd probably say, you know, just like when you go to college, you're like, oh, I'm from the Bay Area, or I'm from SoCal. Yeah. So you say like, oh, I'm from LA. Right, yeah. And then they're like, oh, LA, the city. Yeah. Even though you're in like a suburb, like... Yeah, you're you know, really like an hour or two like an hour from or two, LA. Yeah. Um, so... I guess, you know, it provided a lot of insight into what people, like, I guess... The interesting parts of you. Yeah, the interesting parts of me, which many people might not even question that about themselves because they've had the same friends for most of their life, so they've already established a lot of this, and they've only had to to do it once. Yeah, you don't really have to explain who you are to people that you've known for years and years, but moving around, you probably had to do that a lot, and so you've learned, like... Oh, who, who am I? Like, what is, what is Bryce Morgan? (laughs) Yeah. And with that, um, there's, I guess some good and some bad, like I've probably met more people than a lot who haven't moved just because in a, in a way it taught me the lesson that some people come and go, but it also taught me that just because you're moving around and just because there's distance, it doesn't mean that you have to break ties with, Mm -hmm. with, with other people. Some of my best friends are people that, I might not have physically seen in a year or two, but we just have had such a strong connection plus the ability to keep in touch where location almost doesn't really matter. Um, 
I guess something that always like scared me prior to moving was, oh, will this friend group that I made here be the ones that still reach out to me in 10 years? Like that's always kind of been like a, like a deeper fear. And, you know, honestly, there's some friend groups that I thought would last longer. And then either it's because the age that you move at, you don't have, you know, some of the, a lot of the moves didn't, like I didn't have a cell phone or whatever. I would have to find them on Facebook a year later, whatever. Whenever you got on Facebook, way up. Yeah. And a lot of those early childship or childhood friendships did fall off because you can be best friends with someone from kindergarten through fifth grade, but when you move you don't have a way to communicate with them, yeah. like it can drop off and that, you know, can kinda suck. But also there's been so many people who have stayed for many years. Like there's some people from middle school who still reach out and at that point that that's a long time ago now (laughs) and stuff like that. It's like, they just really care about you on a fundamental level and surrounding yourself with people like that and trying to keep them in your life, um, is, I don't know, is, is one of the more important things. And it's a two way street. Like you learn how to communicate digitally really well, because if you don't, you lose friends, you could lose friends. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, you bring up an interesting point of like, you're communicating digitally. So in the modern age, we have this privilege of having, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, basically having the ability to, I mean, in some ways, see what everyone's up to all the time. So do you think that that is the biggest reason that you stay in contact with your friends? Or have you had to develop more intentional things than just following them on social media? It has to be much more intentional, at least for me. I think a lot of people, you know, they friend on Facebook, all the people they knew in high school or on Instagram or something like that. And for a lot of people, that's enough. And for me, for a lot of people I went to high school with, that is enough. You know, I only... You can just kind of keep tabs and be like, what are they up to? Yeah, like, you know, we met in ninth grade. We had history class together and we followed each other on Facebook. And now I kind of see what they're up to, but... I'm not going to text them. You know, we didn't have that kind of close friendship. Um, But for the people that I'm really talking about where the friendship lasts, it's honestly at least like weekly or biweekly communication in some aspect. Like you have to text, you have to call, you have to put in that that effort. And, you know, not going to lie, there's times where I do want to chuck my phone out a window because I feel like I've been staring at it for too long. But I guess the draw to not doing that is, well, now I can't talk to all these like friendships that I've made along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. With social media, it's kind of interesting. There's, you know, I took a year off social media for like, I guess Instagram was the only one I really used. And that's the one I took a break from because a lot of people have probably heard this narrative where like, it's, it's bad for your mental health and you only see the good parts and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I kind of, got tied into that too and cut it off and you know now i'm i'm back on it and i feel like i have like a healthier mindset towards it where i can look at something with a grain of salt yeah i can take everything with a grain of salt because you know if you look at my images on there there are a lot of these like photos that i've taken that i'm really proud of and want to like showcase and if i sum up if i went on this whole week-long trip and you see these four images that I'm really proud of in terms of like a photography sense, like I'm proud of the images that I've taken, but people see it as this like beautiful, um, like, you know, as if the entire experience is this like one highlight moment, then that's just not true. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of gaining perspective on that. I feel like I have a healthier relationship with it and, and it's fine, but I, I don't know. I don't try to really keep up with friends through social media. It's mainly through like texts and calls. Okay. So you mentioned earlier, you've sort of, you developed your passion for brewing before you developed a job in brewing. Right. So what was the biggest surprise going from purely homebrew to seeing industrial scale at the second largest craft brewery in America? (laughs) Attention to detail. um, And definitely like, yeah, attention to detail and, and the stakes of what you're doing. It's... Mm -hmm. It's one thing to like mess up a homebrew where you're like, oh shoot, that cost me 40 bucks, but I can do it again tomorrow. Or like, oh, it didn't go perfectly, but I can like try to fix it in this next step of the brewing process to like 
it's yeah. it's a business it's, it's for profit and you kind of need to get it right and um there's you know there's a lot of pressure that comes with that especially being more on the on the research side where like the questions that we deal with aren't are ones that don't have obvious answers yeah because um, you're, you're you're at the cutting edge of brewing science right because yeah we have the whole lab we're testing everything and we have many long-term projects, and the only reason they're long-term is because there isn't yet historical knowledge on it. Like, as the trends in brewing change and the type of beers that people want change, like, you know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, no one wanted a hazy beer. Like, that was, if you look at any, like, research... That was gross. That was, was gross. unpure. There's something yeah. wrong with it back then if, if there yeah. was haze. And now you look at anything, and there's this big, like, kick for, like, unfiltered, hazy yeah. things, and... And I guess what, like, the common beer drinker who likes those things might not understand is, like, it's it's hard to get that, like, natural, unfiltered type product. Like, yeah. they think it's probably less work to get it, but it's it's very intentional in all the There's a process whole science things. of just the haze. There's a, Yeah, and it's, like, people spent so long trying to get rid of it that all of a sudden it's kind of hard with modern brewing technology to keep it. Yeah. You almost have to, like pick and choose all these variables to actually like get something that used to be undesirable for a, a aesthetic reason and now there's this whole like more natural narrative tied around yeah. unfiltered products you know you look at everything's becoming more natural and organic and and you know a lot of that stuff is it's not just oh we let it do its thing and now it's more natural it's like you there's a whole new science to making it more natural but also making it repeatably the same yeah product and yeah consistently you know. natural which is just consistently not grossly against the idea of nature <laughs> <laughs> which i mean yeah and yeah. you think of like like wine there's this uh there's this seasonality that everyone kind of accepts like season to season the wine's going to taste a little different because yeah. the weather the wine and tastes the, the same as a spring wine or something like that yeah like you know people get into year, like year. what was the weather like that year who yeah. was managing the soil and all that kind of stuff um but with beer it's just as seasonal but consumers want it to taste the same so yeah. the industry shifts towards that and you know we very successfully do make it taste the same and it's 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 very intentional and there's a lot of work that I think that people don't see to like kind of make that happen. Yeah. Right on. So in, in, in your role in sort of an R and D aspect, obviously there's some things that, you know, are essentially top secret. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what are some of the projects that you can talk about that you're particularly proud of and what was your role in that? Um, I mean, honestly, in my current job, I don't know if I'm going to talk about any of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, I guess to kind of answer that question on, like, a, a homebrew thing that I've sure. done, like, what I'm yeah. intention what I'm proud of, what I've intentionally gone for is, like, before I even started working there, the first homebrew beer I did was the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, and... Like, you took their recipe that they had, or the, there, the public there's recipe. There's shifted homebrew copycat type gotcha. things, where if you look at the actual recipe, like, it is different. Because when you go to a local homebrew shop, like, they're going to have different hops, they're going to have different... Yeah. They don't source them from a particular area in very intentionally. Yeah, like, just like, let's get hops. Breweries use like all grain and, and in home brewing, you're sometimes using powders and mill, like yeah. th things like the whole process is, is just more essentially different, yeah. but you know, you can Google like any top beer and there'll be a homebrew copycat. And it, essentially that's what I kind of went for. Cause I already mm -hmm. like their products, but I guess getting it right on my first shot with, obviously it's not gonna taste exactly like the main one but at that point i was pretty inexperienced beer drinker i was like oh this is pretty close like it's yeah. pretty cool it's the same thing it's it, it, <laughs> it not but yeah d yeah d uh definitely not the same thing but it just instilled this like pride where it's like i set out to make something and you know i threw the dart and it landed somewhat close to yeah. the middle of the board and yeah. and i mean that really just kind of kick-started like my interest in, 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 in like all of it is like you try to solve something and eventually you get it right. Not yeah. the first time, maybe that, that was kind of like a lucky shot, but, um, with other stuff. Right on. So we sort of talked about this, but I think we could expand more on it. So you recently graduated college. It's been 
seven-ish months. Yeah. Um, what has been the most difficult as well as the most relieving part of transitioning into, you know, a career employee? Hmm. Um, the most... <sighs> The most relieving, I can say instantly, is no homework. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I I knew from the summer jobs I worked that I enjoyed the workforce more than school. I, I really like school, um, and all in all, I think it was a great experience, but there was always that constant stress of, like, whether it's 8 a.m. or 8 p.m., I'm always stressing about it. There's always something more I could do. Yeah. There's an assignment, even if it's a month away, it's on exactly. the syllabus and you know it's there. Yeah, like, you know, any schooling, high school or college, it's it's compromised of stuff that's due tomorrow and stuff that's due next month. And because of that, there is never an end. Yeah. Even on, like, winter break, it's like, you might not do anything that week, but some teacher put a project due the Tuesday you come back or something like that. So even you're already thinking of that. And I could never truly separate myself from that and that schooling stress but with work although not perfect it is a little bit easier to know like the house that i come home to is an environment where i'm not working on things i leave intentionally to work and i come home and there's a clear separation that's good but with school you know you come home and then you open your textbook and you start homework um it's homework after all it's homework yeah, yeah. so the most relieving thing would definitely be um the separation from like having to work at home on things. Um, the more difficult part, I guess kind of roping back to what we talked about earlier is like time to explore other passions. Um, there is time for that. And, you know, I don't have to commute at all, which is really nice. So mm -hmm. I have more time than probably the average person. And there are things that I do every week that I do get to kind of separate myself from it. But there was an initial like culture shock of like, oh, wow, I need to come home and cook dinner. And by the time I'm all done with it, it's 8 p.m. And I'm tired, so I might just, like, watch Netflix and call it early. Yeah. Um, it, it There's very intentional steps that I had to set up to kind of, like, break that routine that I think a lot of people fall into really easily of just yeah. getting home and not doing anything because they were so tired. Like, you know, y you work and you enjoy it, but you also have to enjoy your time off. And sometimes that is, like, even though you're tired, trying to go for that run or, you know, actually cook something nice or not just like succumbing to sitting on the couch so what what inspires you to do that because obviously like you said it's it's very difficult to break that trend of going home you know picking up food on the way home or picking it up right after you get home and so how, how do you get the inspiration to cook go out and work out go on you know a night out mm -hmm. um just calling back to the moments that i truly am at my happiest and that's you know like everyone talks about you get like endorphins and like a running high and stuff like that but it's it's really like I am a type of person who really enjoys feeling productive I love like checking things off and I I just like having like healthy habits so and that kind of started in in high school the first part of my life I was the household who we didn't have like a ton of junk food around. So I'd go to my friend's house and all I'd want to do is like eat their junk food. Yeah, and, like give me an Oreo. <laughs> yeah. And, and my, my whole world was like consumed with food. And like many kids, the only exercise I would get would be like, if I'm playing like a game, you know, I'm yeah. like running around and stuff like that. But you know, and, and kids shouldn't have like intentional, like workout stuff, but eventually like high school came around, you know, people aren't like, playing anymore like you have to be a little more intentional about it and it started with really like eating maybe a little too healthy back then like caring a little bit too much yeah. and I guess it taught me like man I like having a, at least a little bit of control over like staying healthy because it makes me feel better that week it makes me feel better the next day and once you like intentionally do something that makes you feel better it's kind of like a craving they just kind of want to chase and that eventually came to also not just be food, but exercise with like sports that I did in high school, sports I did in college. Um, it's just that like kind of feeling of a productivity and be like, yeah, like I, I physically and mentally feel good because I I'm taking care of myself and you know, it's not like I'm going on long runs every morning and I'm eating kale salads every day. Like yeah. I've definitely fallen to much more of a, of a balance now. Um, of, you know, like I'll 
you know, I'll eat ice cream and I'll do all this stuff because I, it is more of a balance. And I think now I've kind of like learned to realize that. Yeah. And not like overdo it. Not like overdo it. Yeah. So what you mentioned that, or I'm going to cut that bit. Um, so what's, what's next in general? Like what passion projects are you currently working on? Where do you see or where would you like your career to go one day? What is, what is the future for you? Yeah, I guess passion projects. I really want to get a lot of my photography kind of like off Instagram and off my camera roll and onto like an actual website. Um, it's, you know, I brought up a couple times that my photography is something that I'm just really proud of. It, it instilled the sense of adventure in me early on where like I have to go to cool places to take photos and, and it, it's kind of a, a gateway to going on more adventures in the future is like trying to keep up with taking more photos just to get me out and doing stuff, going on bigger trips, seeing new places. Um, so creating like an official website, which I've already started, but you know, I definitely need to put more work into kind of getting this portfolio together just cause it's something completely unrelated from what I do every day but is also something that i i have a lot of passion for so and you want to share your and i want to share it like i i like i like having the images for myself so it's also nice to just even if no one goes to the website it's it's nice to like have that portfolio just so when i want to look at images i've taken i i have a spot for it and you know, who knows, maybe one day I'll print some and frame it and someone will, will want to buy it. But it's it's more just because I genuinely get a lot of enjoyment from, like, seeing um, something come from, like, oh, I'm going on this trip to, like, oh, wow, I came back with these photos that I'm really happy about. And now they're all in one place with all these other memories of other places I've been. So that's, that's like, a big um, passion project that I'd like to kind of put more work into and solidify in the future. Um, in terms of what next, more just playing it by ear. I definitely really like where I'm at now. Um, and I think like switching into the food science world was like a really good choice for me. I, I'm very passionate about everything I do and I, yeah, I'm just very much enjoying it. Um, so kind of like stick around, see what happens. Um, but also try to be a little more intentional with like finding time for those hobbies. Yeah. Right on. Well, uh, Bryce, thank you so much for coming on the show. I think we had a great conversation. I hope people enjoy it. Do you have any shout outs or anything? Um, ooh, shout outs. Final comments, whatever. Gosh. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess to, to the listener, like, I feel like a lot of our conversation kind of focused on passion and stuff like that. So I'd say just like if there's something that you're trying to do but have been pushing off that you think you'd find like genuine fulfillment in try to just create some time for it and really like search for what you want to do right on well thank you very much yeah thank you thanks for having me if you like this show please consider following and subscribing on whichever platform you are listening on and share it around if you think it's interesting and insightful